Hi everyone. Welcome to another group worship time of Heritage Baptist Church. It's done virtual and we're looking forward to the time when we can actually be together, but it's not yet. So thank you for joining us this morning. As we get started with our time, I would like to share a few announcements just to take care of some housekeeping duties for our church. Uh, our first announcement is for the ladies, and it is that Lynn has the books for the ladies' book study. And the book that they're doing this time is called A Woman Who Reflects the Heart of Jesus. If you didn't sign up and you would like to take part, let Len know right away. If you did sign up, she has the books for you. But if you didn't and you'd like her to get a book, let Len know one way or another, either through email or a phone call or some other way like that, but contact her. I also would like to say thank you to all of you who have been giving toward our church ministries. I just want to let you know that we recognize your faithfulness. You have continued to give, even though we haven't been at church and we haven't been passing the offering plate, but you've been giving. As I talked to our treasurer, he's let me know that things have gone well in that department. So thank you very much for caring for the Lord's ministry and trying to see it uh, continue in this way. Just want to remind you that if you are going to send in your offering, to send it to our church's P.O. Box number, not to the treasurer's house. That would be P.O. Box 631, Grayling, Michigan, 49738. And uh, he will get it and get everything put into the proper places as it should be. I'd also like to share a couple thoughts as we are uh, continuing on in our stay-at-home order under the COVID-19 pandemic. And I just want to let you know that, yes, we understand that the time is drawing near. We're getting closer to be able to um, meet as a group. In fact, I heard on the radio just this week that there's a group of churches near us that are beginning to meet. But I wanted to let you know that we are thinking that through. Uh, the leadership and I still need to get together. <clears throat> we haven't uh, had that meeting yet where we try to put all those things into place. But I could share with you some of my thoughts. And uh, my thoughts is that is this, that we're in no hurry in the sense that we want to be careful. We want to be careful that uh, the needs of each of our people is taken care of, especially those who have compromised health situations. And we do have several that would fit into there. So we're trying to be careful with them. Also, we are not under any type of persecution. This isn't a situation where the state is trying to push us back as a church. If they were, this would be different, and we probably would become the underground church and be meeting that way, but that's not what we find ourselves in. This truly is for a health situation. Whether you agree with the way that it's being done or you agree with the measures that are taken, that's a different story, but it is because of health. So we are trying to be careful in that sense and uh, we are going to meet as soon as we believe it's safe as soon as first of all we need to be given permission because we believe romans 13 teaches that we need to obey the authorities that god allows to be over us and that would be our state our governor and so forth so we are going to be careful with those things but when we can we do want to be back together again. And I firmly believe that that's going to be sooner than later. I believe it's going to be uh, not too far in the future. I'm, I'm a little scared to give a date or anything of that nature just in case things happen that we don't foresee right now. But we want to make it just as soon as possible so that we can be together, but do it safely and care for the needs of each other, as well as have a good testimony in our community because people are watching and we would not want to be the source of another flare up and get a bad testimony because of that. So we, we are thinking that through. The deacons and I will be discussing it. I just wanted to let you know that that is coming. Well, as we uh, move on into our worship service, let's begin with a song. I chose a song that I think would cheer each one of us up and gives us something to look forward to. And that would be When the Roll is Called Up Yonder.
I hope that you're singing along with us. What a wonderful hope. One day we're going to be with the Lord. We're going to be in heaven. And it, one of us might go ahead of the other, but the day is coming when we'll all be there and be able to rejoice with the Lord Jesus. Looking forward to that. We have been in contact with our missionaries. They are also in lockdown, not only the ones here in the States, but the one overseas as well. And uh, we have greeting videos from both of them. First of all, we'll have a video from Pete and Dar Ringelberg, and then from uh, the Sturgeons down in Bolivia, uh, Bob and Terry. So enjoy their greetings. Greetings from your missionary builders, Pete and Darla Ringelberg. Because of the COVID-19 stay-at-home order, that's where we're at. We're currently at home. I've taken over the dining room table with all of my computers and drawing stuff. And we're currently working on the blueprints for four different churches here. The most recent one is Chardon Baptist Church in Chardon, Ohio, which is a remodel. We do thank you for your continued prayers for us and your financial support. You stay home as well and stay safe. God bless. Hello, everybody. I'm still trying to find my good side here. Uh, Paul, I do have a good side. I just haven't found it yet. We're doing well here in Bolivia. Uh, we're uh, locked down like everybody else. Uh, the cities, some of the cities are militarized. They got the police and the military out there stopping people. But we're healthy. We're doing well and waiting to get back to work soon, hopefully. We're looking at the end of uh, April, but we'll see what happens. Hi, everybody. Uh, just want to let you know that uh, we're thinking about you. We miss you all. Uh, we're doing fine. We um, uh, have restrictions, but here in the in the countryside, uh, that's not that bad. Um, and uh, um, just keep us in prayer as we will for you. Bye. We love our missionaries, and we believe that we are a part of their ministries, and they're a part of our ministries as well. Do continue to pray for them. I know that they would appreciate that. Speaking of prayer, I do have some other prayer requests that I'd like to share with you. Uh, we've been able to put out emails, and a number of you have been praying, and I appreciate the fact that you're ministering to each other in this way. And don't miss that fact. You generally are ministering. You're in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ as you pray for each other and put these needs before the throne of grace. Let me share just a few of them with you. First of all, we got word, I believe just today, that Wendy, that would be Barry's friend, Wendy and Anthony were in a car accident today. Now they're fine. They both were able to walk away unharmed, but apparently a box truck hit them and uh, they weren't able to get out of the way. So uh, be thankful that they're safe, but pray for them as well. They're probably going to be feeling it in a day or so, physically speaking. And then our friend Barb B., is back from her trip down south. I believe she was in Texas and uh, she's back. So we look forward to being able to get back in touch with her pretty soon. But she's also shared with us that her daughter, Patty, had surgery and treatment for a brain tumor. It's a pretty serious situation. So uh, be praying for them. Apparently uh, these treatments were very much necessary uh, in order to extend her life. So do be praying for Patty and for Barb as well. We've been in contact with June Fisher in her nursing home downstate, and we ask you to pray for her. She has some physical issues from time to time, and right now she's been struggling with some pain in her legs uh, that have really been bothering her. So do be praying for June. And then uh, Bob G's mom, Jackie is uh, also in a nursing home. And Bob has shared with us that uh, she's dealing with shoulder pain right now, as well as some discouragement. So do be praying for her and pray for Bob and Janet as they try to help take care of her while she's up there. So do be praying for them. And then our friends from Kalamazoo, Ralph and Denny, uh, they have a cabin up here in our area. And in years past, when they could get up, they would come to church with us. Uh, pray for them. As many of you know, Ralph is struggling, and uh, he uh, actually spends a lot of his time in a wheelchair, and he's struggling with strength in his legs. So pray for him. And because of that, it's also causing him sleep trouble. So I know that they would appreciate you praying for them and asking for God to give mercy and to give strength and to give comfort during this time. 
So continue to pray for each other. Thank you. I ask you to pray for me as your pastor. Uh, I need wisdom. Of course, I have to handle my schedule. I have to handle the the summer job that I have that has started back up. And uh, also just the idea of, of how to uh, handle things as we decide to start getting back together and meeting in person in our church building. I appreciate the prayer for wisdom for me as well as for our deacons as we discuss those things. Thank you very much. Well, let's sing another song. This time, let's sing the song, Creation Sings. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to pick up the series that we began. We are starting the second half of the book of Ephesians. It's that practical part of the book where Paul takes all of the doctrinal teaching he gave us in the beginning, and now he's applying that teaching to the way we live out our lives. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. But I'd like you to just take a moment and consider our church, especially in the sense of how our church operates and how uh, the things that happen there happen. And, and I'm speaking at, at this point, the, the building, when we're at the building, how we make services happen, but also just we as a group, as we are together and trying to live out uh, being the body of Christ as his church. Uh, consider this for a moment. Consider all the people that are involved and all of the different uh, skill sets, uh, personalities, and spiritual gifts that it takes for that to happen. Of course, you would probably think of leadership. I mean, I'm the pastor. Uh, we have our deacons as well, and we try to lead the church. So there's that. But what about uh, at the services? Uh, do you know who all is involved at the services that we have? Well, we have Donna 
who runs the Clavinova for us, and we greatly appreciate that, as well as people that fill in when she's not there. Uh, we have Whitney, who puts together our multimedia things, and Bob, who helps her by running the sound system, and uh, they have to coordinate all those things. There's Lynn, who runs the children's ministry when those kids come with their grandmas, and uh, Lynn takes them out for junior church. She's involved. In Sunday school, we have our various teachers. There's Paul, there's Carl, and sometimes I even get to still teach Sunday school. But all of those people have to have the things ready for those things to take place. Um, there's the ladies Bible study. And I'm thinking at this point of Lynn with the ladies book study and brunch and how she gets that going. And then even Angie, uh, if she continues having the Bible study that she has at her house during the week, but they're involved there. What about other things though? Uh, in the church services. What about our offerings? Do you remember John? John, I like to think of John as a bouncer. I, I wonder what visitors think of when they come to church and they see this, this big strapping young man coming down the aisle. Uh, there's John. But all the people that help him with that and help uh, count the funds after they're taken and make sure that it's done properly and upright. Uh, you think of Paul, Bob, both Carl's, Bill, and others that would help them as well. They're all involved. One thing you might not consider is in the winter, we have to shovel snow a lot. Well, Carl gets there early, quite often on Sunday mornings, and he shovels those walks for us. We don't even see him doing it, but yet he does do that. And most importantly, he gets the coffee pots running after he's done. So that's, that's an important thing. Our communion. Donna and Margaret both get those things together, get, get it all put together so that our service is ready uh, to run smoothly. Um, did you know that we have someone who waters our piano? And we have a special uh, setup with a piano to keep it from getting too dry or too moist. And Margaret is the one who takes care of that. By the way, Margaret, I have uh, watered it once already during the pandemic just to make sure that it stays right where it needs to be. Um, there's other unseen things, though, that happen in our church, and, and you might not think of these as, as ministries, but they certainly are. And consider some of these things. People who greet each other, especially people who make sure that they greet any visitors that show up. Uh, what about people who offer cheer? We've got plenty of those folks here that if they see you come in, they want to cheer you up. They want to give you a hello. And without that happening, it would be kind of a dreary place. But uh, those folks make sure that happens. Uh, we've got uh, lots of you that are involved in helping to clean, signing up to take a month and uh, clean the church. Of course, uh, most of you give and give financially to help the church run. Um, what about cooking? We have those church dinners and all those wonderful cooks that bring that food in. I think when we get back greeting, we're going to have to consider about having a church dinner just as soon as it's safe for us to be able to do that. Um, there's plenty of you that contribute in the discussions that we have, especially in Sunday school and in our afternoon service. Uh, your contributions are not just something that just happens along the way. It's very important. And I don't know about Paul and Carl in Sunday school, but I know when I'm planning the afternoon service, I depend on those conversations and you're contributing into those things. They're important. Um, when we have to set up uh, chairs and tables for different events, a bunch of you pitch in and help with those things. That, that's important, actually. Without that happening, only a couple people would have to do it. And that wouldn't be fair, but instead, many of you help. Uh, we've got yard work that has to take place. We've got bulletin boards that are put together. We've got dishwashing. Maybe some of you recognize the people who do those things and recognize that, that they do a good job at those things. What about transportation? And we don't have a bus ministry, but I, I know that there's a few of you that go around and pick up people that otherwise don't have rides. And that's an important ministry as well. Uh, cards of encouragement. Uh, we have one person in church that does send out cards uh, to encourage everyone, but I know of several others that do it on their own. Wonderful ministry. Uh, you pray for each other. Uh, in, in the fall, when we take up our food shower, um, pretty much all of you contribute by bringing food from that. Uh, all of you contribute encouragement to one another. Uh, Sunday mornings, really, uh, it is a cheerful place around Heritage Baptist because you're offering encouragement. That's important ministry. Remember that. We even have a guy who brings the eggs to our service. 
Barry, we miss you. And uh, we're grateful for that. Now, I could go on and on and on, but there's all kinds of things that happen at our church. And forgive me if I haven't listed the thing that, that you feel that you do well at, uh, but it's important. Continue doing it. Uh, God has has gifted our church with so many different uh, abilities, skill sets, personalities, that it makes our church a wonderful place to be. Thank you. Now, I bring all that up because we're going to look Look at that to some extent today as we consider this passage. We're going to be reading in Ephesians chapter 4, but as we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Lord, we long for the time when we can be together in person. We pray that you'd help that to happen sooner than later. But in the meantime, Lord, uh, bless our time, especially as we're together today, as we are looking at uh, your word. Open up our hearts. Help us to learn from it. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, let's begin reading at verse 7. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended it all is also the one who ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Well, let's take a moment and look at that. I want to point your attention, first of all, in uh, verse 7, where it says, But to each one of us grace was given. I, I believe he's talking about the fact that his grace through the gospel is poured out to us as, as fellow believers, and we responded to that gospel by per turning to Jesus for salvation. But then it says, and, and, um, According to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, when you look at uh, the words that are used here, especially in the original language with words used in other places, it becomes obvious that what Paul is talking about is spiritual gifts, that Jesus gives uh, spiritual gifts to his church. And you're going to see what I mean by that as we move a little bit farther on. But I believe that's what he's talking about. Now, let me show you, first of all, the context of this. Don't forget the context. What happens sometimes when we're studying passages like this is we'll take a verse that we think is talking, like in this case, about spiritual gifts, and we lift that verse out, and then we might even look at some other passages about spiritual gifts, and we totally miss what was the context that it was given in. And I want to point that out because... Paul is not going to have a big discussion on what spiritual gifts are. In fact, that's that's most of what he's going to say about it right there. So we're not going to look at all the types of gifts. We're not going to look at, at the meaning of all the different types. Uh, there is a time and a place for that, but that's not really what Paul's getting at here. Let me show you what I mean. Consider the context. The context here, we're going to go back to the beginning of this chapter, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And if you'll remember, when we looked at that last time, that Paul is saying we need to be united together in love. We need to be united together uh, through humility, through meekness, and through patience with one another. We need to be united that way. And in these first six verses, he uses a lot of phrases dealing with us as a group. In verse 2, he talks about uh, doing this with one another. In verse 3, he talks about the unity of the Spirit. In verses 4 through 6, he, he mentions that, yes, there's one God, one faith, one baptism, but, but this is what belongs to all of us as a group, so it's in the group context. And then in verse 6, he talks about the fact that, that we have one God and Father who's the Father of us all, and he's talking about all of us as a group. So, so there's a couple ideas here in this uh, context. First is that it's talking about the group. And second of all, that we should have unity. We should be a unified group. Now, with that said, we move on to verse 7. And in verse 7, Paul's going to shift gears. Instead of talking about the group, now he's going to talk about individuals. In fact, look at the very first word of verse 7, but. And he says, but to each one of us, now he's talking about individuals, each one of us. So as a group, we have unity, but we're going to need to also pay attention to the fact that we are each individuals. And as individuals, there's diversity. 
And he's going to actually look at this a little bit later when we get farther into this chapter, when he gets to verse 11, he's going to talk about some of the various things that God has added to the church. But at this point, let's just look at the idea that he wants us to be uh, aware of the fact that, yes, we are a group, but we're also made up of individuals. And we have oneness, but that's not necessarily sameness. Yes, we, we, we're one in the gospel. We believe that Jesus died for our sins and paid the penalty for our sins, and we receive forgiveness based on faith uh, through grace. Uh, we're, we're, we're unified on that. But when it comes to us as individuals, we're all different. And we all serve the Lord in different ways. And I believe that's what he's getting at here by saying that grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. In other words, how he decided to give out these gifts. We'll see that more in just a moment. But uh, let's look at the idea of gifts. What do I mean by gifts? Now, when we get to verses 11 through 16, he's going to talk about uh, certain gifts he's given to the church. And in this case, it's gifted individuals uh, for leadership purposes. And we will see that. But we're going to look at that next week. We won't talk about it very much right now. But he's saying in verse 7 that there's gifts given to each of us. Well, what do you mean by gifts? Well, when we talk about spiritual gifts, we're talking about a type of spiritual enablement uh, that we are each given in order to serve Christ, in order to serve Christ and his body, the church, effectively. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have been given at least one spiritual gift. In other words, you've been given some sort of an enablement to contribute to the body so that the body can be successful, so that the body can move forward and carry out the ministry that Jesus has left us here for until he decides to return. But we each are given some sort of, um, of an enablement to do that. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking about what those different gifts are, what, what the categories of them are, and I don't want to spend much time on that, but I want to point out what Paul is doing here in Ephesians 4. Paul is saying we need to remember that we need to be unified in love. We need to do it with humility. We need to do it with patience. We need to do it with meekness, and we need to be unified in love. But the very idea that God has given different gifts to individuals means that the door is now open for there to be a little bit of divisiveness, a little bit of disunity. Why would that be? Well, as human beings, we tend to get a little jealous of each other. We tend to look and see what someone else does, and we wish that we could do that. You know, that person who just seems to be an encouragement. And when that person walks in a room, other people are so glad to see them there because they encourage them. And we wish, well, I wish I could be an encourager like that. Well, you can still be an encourager, but God has blessed some people in a way that they just tend to encourage people a little more. Um, I, I can remember as, as a Christian, I want to be um, I want to be a good witness. I want to be able to share the gospel with other people. And, and I'll see some people sometimes that it seems like wherever they go, before you know it, they're talking to the people about the Lord. And they do it so easily. And, and I wish, boy, I wish I could be like that. I wish I was more that way. Now, I, I still need to strive to be that way. I still need to be a witness, but some people just have the knack for it. And I would say that's a spiritual gift. And, and we can look at all kinds of other areas. All those things I listed at the beginning of all the people that are involved in serving our church, I believe that for many of them, it comes from spiritual gifts that God has given them. God has given them the gift of service to be able to serve in so many different ways. I remember folks in our church in years past, we talk about Norm and Wanda, and they served in our church. They, they, they took care of the facilities. They uh, made sure it was clean. They made sure the lawn was mowed. I believe they had the gift of service, and God just blessed them with it. And um, we all have differing things like that where we add to the body. That's the idea of spiritual gifts. But what about this idea of it possibly causing disunity. Let, let me show you what I mean. Uh, spiritual gifts come up in a couple of key passages in the scripture, and in each one of those passages, 
There's warnings about being disunified over this. There's warnings about being jealous with this. Uh, in Ephesians 4, if we just start there, you go to verse 2, it talks about the fact that we need to uh, be uh, humble and gentle and long-suffering with one another as we strive to be unified. And it goes right into verse 7, where Christ gives us gifts. Now, let me turn to a couple other places. Romans chapter 12 is one of the key chapters where you'll be able to read about spiritual gifts. I would challenge you to go and read that chapter sometime. But let me just read these verses to you. This is Romans chapter 12. I'm going to begin reading at verse 3. Paul says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. That's the idea going with spiritual gifts. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. And then he goes on and he mentions several of those uh, gifts that God may have uh, poured out to different individuals in our church. And he says, use them. Uh, if you were to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm not going to do that right now for the sake of time. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about spiritual gifts. And in there, he's warning them about being jealous of each other. Maybe you remember the passage where it says, can the hand say to the foot that, that uh, I'm upset because I'm not a foot? Can the eye say to the ear that I, I can't hear so I'm less? No, Paul's saying that's not the case. Each part has its place to play. It's part to play, and they need to do that. I uh, want to turn one more time to 1 Peter chapter 4. In 1 Peter chapter 4, let me begin reading at verse 7. Peter says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So you see there, even there where it's talking about us ministering to each other, it's warning that we need to be careful, make sure that we love each other. You see, we are to be different from the world. We are to uh, not be competing with one another because we're part of the same organization. Uh, the body of Christ, and we have the same goals in mind, and we each fit in in a different place, and we need to make sure that we're content with where we're at and what the Lord has given us to do without uh, getting jealous or getting uh, upset about someone else who gets to do things that maybe you can't do that you wish you could do. Look, there's lots of things that I wish I could do that I'm just not skilled at, or I don't have the personality for, and I could drive myself crazy worrying about that and, and striving to do the things that just aren't me. And we each need to have that mindset. I'm back in uh, Ephesians chapter four, and I believe that's what Paul is talking about here. Uh, God has given us various gifts and talents and abilities, and we need to use them, but be careful that we remain unified. Here's the key from verse 7, where Jesus gave these gifts. Jesus is building his church. He enables us to serve. We need to be content with that service, and we need to serve in those things. You know what happens so many times? We're not content with what we've got to do, and we wish we could be doing what someone else is doing, and we end up not even doing what we've got to do. So our job goes undone. Our function is not being fulfilled. We need to make sure that we do that. Uh, there's various people in our church, various personalities. Uh, some personalities you, you might like spending a lot of time with. Uh, some other personalities, maybe not your cup of tea, but we still need them. We still need all of those people to be a part of our church and a part of our group. No jealousies, no competition. Now, I think the same goes true even with churches. Um, we we're talking about individuals within our church, but, but look beyond our walls and there's other churches. Do you realize how many different types of churches there are? And throughout church history, lots of churches have, have uh, had division 
between their church and another church because maybe the other church did things differently than how they do. Now, I do still believe that we need to watch out for proper doctrine. We need to make sure that churches are teaching the scriptures. So I'm not talking about that at this point, but I'm talking about even within good Bible-believing groups, uh, there's, there's still differences in the way that we do it. Uh, for instance, some churches are more formal. Uh, you know, some churches love formality and they love going through the, the various parts of their services and, and doing them the way that they do them. They love the formality of that. Other churches are more informal and, and they don't want to have the formality. They just enjoy being who they are, doing things the way they do. OK, those are two different types of churches. Some churches are extremely musical. They have lots of musical talent, lots of musical gifts, and people use their musical talents coupled with their spiritual gifts, maybe the gift of encouragement or the gift of insight, and they use their music uh, to encourage a lot of other people. But other churches aren't so musical. Uh, how does that uh, pan out? Do churches get upset? A church that's not very musical, do they then try to say, well, well, music's not as important as, as you think, and they want they want to just do this, and, and they kind of get down on people that, that enjoy their music. I don't think we should be doing that. I think we need to realize there's differences there, and we need to allow the differences to take place. I know in our town, there's other churches that preach the gospel, and they do things differently than we do. But what I'm grateful for is they're reaching the people with the gospel of Jesus Christ that we will not be able to reach. And on the other hand, we reach people that they're not able to reach as well. Let's just do our part rather than having that friction and so forth. So, so let's, let's watch those spiritual gifts. Now, the idea that it says that Christ has given these gifts in verse 7, according to the measure of Christ, uh, what does that mean? And, and why, why is it that Jesus is the one giving those gifts? Now, I know that that seems like a pretty simple question for a lot of us, but consider what Paul's saying here. Let me look at verse 8. He says, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, Paul is actually quoting a psalm here. He's quoting from Psalm 68. And we're not exactly sure if he's quoting a particular verse in there. There's some that think he is because especially the first two phrases there come from a particular verse. Or is he just summing up the entire verse? But, but I want you to think about, or the entire passage, I should say, think about what's going on. If we were to read Psalm, 60 or Psalm 68, I'm not going to do that today for the sake of time. But if you read that, you'll see, first of all, it's written by David. And it's probably written during the time when David and his forces were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Remember, it had been gone for a while before David got there, and they're finally bringing it back to Jerusalem. And they're celebrating, and they're worshiping God, and they're thankful that God has brought them to the point to where they could do this. It's like things have come full circle, and they're back to where they need to be. And they're praising God. And the way that they're praising God is they're, they're painting a picture of God as a conquering hero, you know, like a general that leads an army and maybe maybe their people had been attacked and subjugated by someone in the past. And then now uh, a general has risen up who, who uh, whips the forces into shape and goes into battle and wins the battle and wins their freedom once again. And not only wins their freedom, but he, he rescues all those who were captured in the past and brings them back. And he also brings the spoils of war back with him. And when he brings those spoils of war back with him, guess what he does? He could keep them for himself, enrich himself, but many times these conquering heroes would pass out the treasures amongst their faithful servants. Maybe there were certain soldiers that they wanted to reward. Maybe there were certain family groups that they wanted to reward, and they would pass out these things. Maybe they just wanted to bless everyone, and they passed out some to everyone in their city to uh, cause them to rejoice and to meet some of their needs. Well, that's the picture that Psalm uh, 68 is painting. Now, Paul, back in Ephesians chapter 4, is applying this to Jesus. He's applying that whole thing to Jesus, and he's showing that Jesus is our victorious Savior. 
Um, and that's why he says what he says here in verses 9 and 10, which if you weren't sure, it would not seem like it, why is it there? But now you can see what he's saying. He says, now this, and he means the phrase from Psalm 68 that said he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended? into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Here's what Paul is saying, that when the Lord Jesus came uh, as a conquering hero, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now, I believe what that's getting at is that means he went, came down to the earth, he lived his life, but he went down into the earth in the sense that he was buried and spent time in a grave. And so he did go to the grave. Now, there are some that wonder about, uh, could these verses be applied to uh, when he went into Hades and led Old Testament saints up to heaven with him? Uh, this passage really isn't dealing with that. So I'm not going to spend time on that at this point. But I believe for sure it's saying that Jesus came to earth and he went to the lowest parts of the earth. That is, he actually went to the grave. However, the grave couldn't hold him and he ascended to heaven as the victorious savior that he is. He ascended far up above all things, above his creation, above us as his creatures. And he is there now as our victorious Lord. That's the Lord that we serve. And since he has done that, now he can give out the spoils of his victory. And Paul is applying it in this case of spiritual gifts. When Christ is building his church, and his church is fulfilling her mission on the earth, then Christ gives the spoils of, of his now glory out to the people of his church. And he gives us these gifts. He gives us these spiritual enablements to be able to fulfill the task that he's left for us to do. That's our Savior, a victorious Savior. Now, next week, when we get to verse 11 and following, we're going to look and see in one specific uh, category of types of gifts that he gave, but we'll save that for next week. So consider this. Our Savior has won the victory. He now has spread his gifts amongst his subjects. That's us. Now, we must live in love with each other as we each use the gifts that he has given. Again, Paul's not giving a comprehensive teaching on spiritual gifts, but he is saying that it's a fact that Christ has, has given us all what we need. He's enabled us to be able to carry out the ministries that each one of us individually have in the body of Christ. But in doing that, we need to make sure that we are doing it in humility and in meekness and in patience with one another. As he mentions in chapter 4, verse 2, we need to love one another and to care for one another. Don't fall into the trap of being competitive. Don't fall in the trap of trying to be the one that, that looks the best in any particular area. Just serve the Lord. Just do what you're supposed to do. Follow him. Use your gifts the way he has given them to you. Use your opportunities where he has put you and if, if there's anything that seems to be against you to prevent you from using certain things that you'd like to use, consider that from the Lord. Serve where you're at. Be who you are. Be where you're at and serve there. Don't worry about things that, that don't let you do what you think you should be able to do. Just serve the Lord. And in doing that, it'll enable you to love one another. It'll enable you to care for one another. It'll enable you to truly pray for each other and uh, put that arm proverbially around the other person so that you can say, come on, I'll help you with this. And, and together as a body of Christ, we'll move forward accomplishing the goals that the Savior has left for us to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for um, providing our salvation but then beyond our salvation, Lord, you've provided us a place to serve, a place to uh, follow you, a place to use our skill sets, um, to use our spiritual gifts that you have endowed us with. And I just pray that you help each one of us, Lord, to be faithful in that and to serve where we're at. Lord, help us to not worry so much about how to categorize it or what title we put on it, but just help us to serve wherever we're at. And uh, by and by, we'll find out that that's revealing what our gifts are and uh, how you intend to use us. Bless us, Father, as we try to do that. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen.
Remember, unity in love and unity in diversity. Let's serve the Lord. Let's sing this last song together, Be Thou My Vision. <laughs>